topic today is going to be imperialism, specifically new imperialism, um, which is, uh, I'm going to describe this in a few different phases, and I'll kind of detail what I'm going to, um, how I'm going to discuss that, and then also some discussions about what imperialism is itself. So first I'm going to talk about kind of how, what the older imperialism was, as far as European imperialism goes. Uh, well, first we'll talk about what imperialism is, uh, but then we'll talk about the uh, older imperialism um, in the Americas. Uh, then we're going to talk about how the British kind of get a head start on this new imperialism. So I'll talk about what it is, new imperialism, how it sort of differs from the older uh, European imperialism, and then how Britain gets a head start, how we kind of see some precursors um, in Japan and North Africa, And then we're going to get into the, the full-blown sort of uh, new imperialism, which kind of begins after the 18, well, probably 1880, 1881 uh, is when most people would, would characterize the, the more definite start. Um, so North Africa, also one in South Africa, too. Uh, and then what new, new imperialism itself? In action. Not a good type of action. Uh, and then lastly, the uh, sort of effects it had on society regarding um, <clears throat> debates and, and sort of establishing the foundations for what would be World War One. So that's what we'll go through. So first, let's go through, um, well, briefly, just what imperialism is uh, before we talk about what new imperialism is. So imperialism itself is, uh, it's not specific to Europe by any stretch of the imagination. Um, what many of you are going to realize as you go forward into college and onward is there's this kind of, and a lot of, many historians are, are, are pointing out what I'm about to point out. This isn't like some opinion of mine. Uh, this is a, a valid critique of uh, modern uh, descriptions of imperialism. So imperialism itself uh, has gotten kind of a uh, Euro-Western Euro specific tone uh, attached to it, or meaning attached to it, and that, that's completely false. Imperialism itself has existed certainly since human beings have existed, um, but more specifically, we can absolutely see it in detailed record uh, going all the way back to at least the, uh, the Bronze Ages, uh, if not before. But we, we actually know that at least some form of it actually even took place back in the uh, hunter-gatherer days. But imperialism itself is basically, um, and I guess this kind of by definition excludes it from the hunter-gatherer era because they don't have states, but we can talk about that in a second. Uh, this is basically when any sort of uh, state or group, we'll, we'll just say a state to make it more, more clear, basically invades or takes over another, either directly through military force or they are somehow homogenizing their provinces or uh, other foreign um, entity by controlling their pol politics or economics um, in some way, like uh, through political pressure or through threat of violence or some of the way. It's basically you are being controlled either directly or indirectly by a foreign power uh, is, is kind of how this is characterized. Uh, traditionally, uh, it, it's pretty much just been conquest. So state uh, is basically controlling or manipulating, um, manipulating a foreign uh, state or ethnic group. That's basically what it is. Um, and if you are wondering like why would people attach specific meanings to it uh, for, for Europeans uh, in the you know, after the age of exploration and after this new imperialism era? Well, because certainly it's the most recent uh, and explicit example. We have we have plenty of records of it, um, but it, it's existed before. Anytime you've ever heard of an empire, uh, that's exactly what imperialism is. You you are you the state be the king or emperor or what becomes an emperor, essentially by force uh, or or through some sort of other. Uh, inscrutable manner, they're going to take over, like I said, directly or indirectly, uh, and, and govern foreign entities or ethnic group, groups uh, against their will. Uh, obviously, if they were to willingly join, not by threat of violence, something that wouldn't be imperialism by any means, that's just cooperation uh, or, or, or you know, conjoining the states, but this is uh, certainly not by choice uh, and by force. So again, many examples. Um, I'll, I'll jump back to the hunter-gatherer thing, but since the Neolithic Revolution, this is a, this applies to any empires of the past, 
uh, where they're stretching their influence beyond their own states to others, ethnic groups in other, other states uh, by force. So, uh, I mean, if you've had world history, you know, this goes all the way back to the, uh, um, the, the age of like ancient, ancient Mesopotamia where the city-states would squabble and fight and uh, form empires by conquering one another. Uh, and then it gets a little more uh, advanced when the Persians come along and introduce the centralized system and extend their influence over many, many, many different uh, peoples and regions and ethnic groups. Uh, and it continues throughout history. The Greeks did it, the Romans did it, the Chinese did it. Um, if you're wondering, China specifically, like the, the Han Chinese people themselves that only inhabit a certain portion of China, the rest is ethnically, linguistically, racially uh, different. Um, they are not homogenous. They are uh, and have been formed uh, through uh, imperial conquest and empire building. Uh, same with contemporary Russia, uh, all of the empires of India uh, played, a, played a similar role. Those were all imperialism where they are forcibly, um, you know, uh, bringing some sort of state or foreign entity or ethnic group uh, under their control. Um, and it's happened throughout the entire world. Uh, Persia, Ottoman Empire, uh, the Arabs breaking out of uh, Arabia and, and going on their, their, their uh, conquests of North Africa, partly into Europe, Central Asia, South Asia, uh, into Persia. Those are all examples of imperialism where they, they forcibly take over uh, and uh, through violent means and, and exert uh, political economic pressure or control. Um, we've had plenty of examples uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, with the House of Asante, Congo, and, and Mali, all these other different empires, that's exactly what they were. Uh, in the Americas, the biggest examples that we know about uh, are the Aztec, uh, you've also got uh, the Incans, but you've also got you know other, other confederacies like the Iroquois and the Algonquins and all, all kinds uh, that are forcibly combating others uh, and um, bringing them under control um, against their will. Uh, the Mongols, it goes throughout history. You, you can name any empire, that's imperialism. Uh, even on smaller scales, uh, anytime it's, it's, it's by force or unwillingly. That's, that is technically a form of imperialism. Uh, and we should also note, too, that this is uh, historically uh, associated with uh, mass, uh, mass suffering and death. Uh, usually the conquered peoples, of course, are taken over by force, so you have those casualties. Uh, but then they're most often, um, at the very best, granted some sort of second-class citizen status, uh, usually slaves, uh, which wouldn't even be second-class citizen, that's a, that's a non-citizen. Uh, so uh, throughout history, again, going all the way back to the Neolithic uh, and even Paleolithic uh, eras of the hunter-gatherers, uh, slavery was, was, was de facto. In fact, all of this was de facto. This was the norm. Uh, Pre-society and post-society, these were all de facto uh, practices, imperial practices. So <clears throat> the Europeans aren't doing anything unique here. Um, the only thing that's unique is the scale at which they're doing it. Uh, and they, they sort of have some, at least some of them have these either pseudo-scientific social Darwin um, justifications and rationalizations for, um, for, their, for, their, uh, for their conquest. Uh, you also have, of course, that competition and nationalism, that very counter-enlightenment um, uh, movement that's uh, at least manifested in this way, uh, certainly a, a very, uh, toxic, detrimental, um, deleterious uh, implementation or, 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 or manifestation of nationalism. Um, so th those do make it different, but these characteristics were, again, de facto through human history. And I do want to go briefly back here for a moment. Even hunter-gatherers arguably practiced a form of this. Now, they didn't have complex state systems with, you know, m mobilizing mass resources and, and multiple people. They were in groups of 50 to 200, but uh, we have plenty, plenty, plenty of archaeological findings and contemporary um, observations for hunter-gatherer and horticult horticultural groups in like Papua New Guinea, uh, some in the uh, regions, regions of Central Africa, uh, in the Amazon, uh, other places here in, in South Asia where we, we still have uh, societies like this. They engage in warfare frequently. It looks different because it's smaller, uh, but nonetheless it's the same thing. They, um, they are rewarded for, for violence. Um, one, one example uh, is how uh, they noted that more violent individuals in contemporary hunter-gatherer groups uh, and horticultural groups have more uh, wives and offspring, uh, and they routinely uh, engage in raids on rival groups. They take uh, uh, territory and resources whenever it's possible, um, and if they can get away with it too, they, they engage in uh, warfare, the killing of males and the taking of or killing of children too. Uh, and, and women as, as sort of a price for that. And again, we have many archaeological findings of these uh, 
Paleolithic era, you know, massacres uh, when uh, when they can get away that they do. Now, again, that's not organized quite like you would think a modern state system is, but it's essentially the same thing: plundering uh, your rivals uh, against their will, uh, killing and taking advantage of them uh, and their resources, and then of course uh, taking as slaves or, or or group members the kids and the women or whoever it is you're you're taking on. That would just be imperialism under a different a different name because they lack a an organized state system. Nonetheless, uh, it was characteristic of many of those civilizations and every civilization since that we have record of has engaged in this all the way up to uh, the 19th and 20th century when uh, Europeans, while still practicing a lot of the more uh, damaging uh, or engaging in many, many of the damaging behaviors like conquest and uh, gen genocide on occasion. We'll talk about how the Belgians and Germans specifically did that on a couple occasions. Um, but uh, notably different was their desire actually to, um, I'm not, this is no apologetic for imperialism, it doesn't make it a noble conquest, but they did, unlike other past examples of, of imperialism, actually endeavor to eliminate slavery rather than um, use it or include it or benefit from it. So that actually is one of the expressed goals of most of these Europeans uh, in, in this new imperialist wave is to, uh, uh, they, they largely uh, in Europe and in their own empires eliminated slavery, made it illegal, banned it. Um, but uh, they're also gonna try to end it in the places that come under imperial control where it's still going on uh, with the slave trade in Africa still going on uh, and in the uh, Muslim world and parts of Asia, uh, the, the slave trade was was alive and well, and the practice of slavery was alive and well. They were they were trying to end that. Um, but uh, other than that, the the Europeans this time around tended to be less genocidal than was normal, although it did happen on occasion, uh, and it should be condemned rightfully so. Uh, and one of their um, endeavors was actually to end slavery, although you're going to have some slave-like, if not outright slave. Uh, conditions, like I mentioned with the, the, some of the Belgian and uh, German examples uh, in Africa. Um, but it, that, that's really the only difference aside from the scale uh, and the means, too. Another, another difference in European imperialism was um, it was across, it was mostly naval. Uh, it, most empires had been uh, land empires that had grown from one central location outward, like China, Russia, Persia, uh, any of the uh, Muslim empires, the Indian empires, the Aztec Inca, those are all land-based empires. Um, we've had a few in history that were primarily naval. Certainly the um, uh, Shubhabayat and uh, Mahajapit um, empires of, of Indonesia in the, uh, uh, what was it, the 10th to 13th centuries uh, were primarily navally based. But other than that, maybe the Venetians uh, and, and some of those Genoese, um, I guess you could call them empires in the Mediterranean, they were largely non-navally focused. It was, it was mostly land empire, land conquest. Europeans were different in that they left from Europe in their uh, ships and established uh, waves of, of fortifications on and, and bases on the coast or in the Americas established colonies and then later established colonies in Africa and Asia too. So that's where the only difference is uh, a slightly different focus. Um, and, 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 a, and an odd sort of, well not odd, it makes sense if you know about the Enlightenment, uh, a, but, a, but a, an odd strain of humanitarian, uh, a humanitarian agenda, while of course still practicing some very inhumane um, uh, policies and um, running some colonies in a very non-humane manner. Uh, but uh, it's gonna be largely different because of this, this naval-based maritime empire uh, rather than a traditional uh, one that is more so uh, indicative of, of a land empire expanding from a central point. Um, but, but it is going to be somewhat different, but just know that imperialism is not unique to Europeans uh, during the age of exploration or the 19th century and 20th century. Uh, by no means uh, it's been a norm for human history that does not make it as right or condone the behavior by any means. That is not what this is, but just understand the context of it historically uh, as this sort of behavior is largely coming to an end. It still exists. There are still examples of it, at least economic imperialism um, and uh, um, espionage throughout the, the Cold War. You've still got arguably examples of that going on now, uh, but the scale is drastically reduced. Now the norm is maintain boundaries and borders 
uh, and states and anyone that's violating that uh, comes with the scrutiny of, 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 um, of a global organization uh, or military alliance like NATO or the United Nations uh, or, or, or whatever it might be. All right, so uh, kind of a last hurrah for imperialism, thankfully, uh, this wave that goes all the way up until about uh, the uh, era of decolonization after World War II. Um, but it, it's going to be a little different, but again, this was the norm throughout history. Um, so don't think it's somehow unique to Western civilization, uh, because it was most certainly not. Other empires that stopped, stopped because um, of logistical reasons uh, or a lack of technology. Uh, that was really the, the, the main difference. Okay, so that's what imperialism is. Now what's going to set apart this, and I already touched on some of it. Um, let's first talk actually about the first wave of European imperialism, and that's going to be uh, the Age of Exploration, basically about the 1490s or so. Um, really early on, maybe even a little earlier if you're talking about the Portuguese in West Africa, but certainly by the 1490s, uh, going all the way up until uh, most historians kind of conclude this era ends with the uh, Latin American revolutions. Certainly the American Revolution um, uh, for the United States in 1776 uh, was the beginning of the end for this era, uh, but definitely when, when the Spanish Empire collapsed in uh, Central and, and South America, that would be certainly the end of this wave of imperialism. So what, what sort of embodied this, so this is kind of like first uh, wave of European imperialism. Uh, it's going to be characterized by um, primarily f establishing colonies by conquest uh, through military uh, action, uh, occasional genocide, and mostly the unintended spreading of old world diseases to the new world. Uh, you're going to have the colonizing of the Americas. Americas colonized. And unfortunately, uh, for the uh, American Indians throughout North and Central and South America and the Caribbean and other like, areas over there, uh, they're going to be uh, largely wiped out, mostly to disease, but, but also to, uh, through conquest. Um, so that's the Americas are colonized. And there are going to be European imperial, uh, is an imperial presence uh, in Africa and Asia, but it's, it's not going to be um, on the scale or to the degree that it is in the Americas. Uh, the, well, first of all, in Africa and Asia, those populations generally have similar um, disease resistances to Europeans, so there's no inherent, uh, at least large-scale, uh, immune, uh, immunology, immunological, I guess you might say, immunological uh, advantage. Um, and at this point, Europeans do not have the economic capacity or the technological capacity to uh, send small amounts of troops uh, and ships and conquer these established land empires, uh, whether it's empires in Africa or diseases in, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, or the empires uh, and the, just the sheer distance of these established states uh, in East Asia and South and Southeast Asia. So uh, not gonna, not conquering uh, Africa and Asia, Uh, but they do establish with the advantage that they do have, particularly with gunboats, uh, with the Portuguese, um, and then the, later the British and the Dutch and the French, uh, and others, even the, Den the Danish get in there uh, as well. Uh, they're going to establish those sort of uh, port-based um, uh, empires that you wouldn't really characterize as empires, but they basically just uh, own and operate several um, trade ports uh, throughout Africa, uh, Asia, and the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, to engage with or control or facilitate or charge for uh, trade for the next few centuries. So uh, no, no, no large-scale conquest in these areas uh, during this era of imperialism, this first wave, uh, but they are going to have uh, control of port cities. Uh, extending all the way up to, uh, uh, the, I believe, the Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch, at least briefly, and the Dutch maintain it, uh, establish uh, trade posts in Japan. Not militaristically held, but that's the extent of it. The, the furthest one I've, I'm aware of uh, were, the, uh, were the Portuguese that established one uh, in southern China and held for a long, a long, quite a long time uh, in Macau. Uh, but that's going to characterize the first wave. Um, so that's the first wave of European, um, what, what's the word like for? Imperialism. The second wave, and there's going to be one uh, exception to this, and this is the actions of Great Britain, because they get a jump start on this, and we'll, and we'll talk about why when we get there. But the second wave is going to be 
uh, kind of most people point to 1881-ish, uh, basically when the practices of free trade began to uh, become unpopular uh, and protectionism reemerged in Europe, uh, not with Great Britain, but uh, with Germany and France certainly. By 1881, the Germans and, and French had sort of backed out of any free trade, and they sort of doubled down on this economic nationalism, almost pseudo-mercantilist um, set of policies where now the concern wasn't trading and commerce between European countries, but trying to grab as many colonies and resources uh, as possible for your own state. Um, and that's, that's, that's got a lot of uh, nationalism uh, driving behind it, but also this protectionist uh, uh, distrust of or frustration with uh, free market economic uh, problems and panics. So 1881 uh, till about, well, certainly the end of World War II when it begins to uh, um, unravel uh, and decolonization begins after World War II. Uh, that's kind of this second wave of imperialism. And what characterizes the uh, this moment is uh, a renewed sense of nationalist competition So the desire, especially by Germany, which we'll, we'll talk about why, at least for a bit, um, to establish their own colonies, because not only was Germany late to the game, because they didn't even establish a, a formal German empire until 1871, uh, but also they were not driven by the same enlightenment inspirations as the, the British, and to a lesser extent, but more than the Germans, uh, the French. Uh, the Germans were much more... Uh, under the influence of German idealism and nationalism, very counter-enlightenment counter ideals that believed in German superiority, uh, even to the most extreme, uh, sort of these foundations for Nazism with places like the Pan-German League, which we'll, we'll talk about here. So this renewed nationalist competition, um, but they also have a, a new set of drives as well. Uh, they're in the look for access to uh, markets, I'll put exclusive markets. The British get, a, like I said, a jump jump start on this, but they, they want to establish after 1881 exclusive uh, rights to commerce um, and trade throughout the world. So the objective becomes, let's us be the French or the Germans or the British or the Japanese later, whoever it might be. Uh, let's establish our ports, factories, get our trade agreements and keep out all of the other uh, Europeans or Japanese uh, merchants uh, and military personnel from establishing bases uh, and trade there. So they're trying to sell stuff to uh, Asians and Africans uh, and disallow their European rivals from doing that. So uh, the search for markets, that's going to mostly take place, but not exclusively, uh, in Asia. And they're also out for um, raw materials and resources uh, for either consumption, like precious metals, diamonds, things like that, or um, components for manufacturing, for running their factories in Europe uh, with, with cheap production uh, costs like uh, rubber, palm oil, um, what else, lots of things, uh, cotton um, throughout India and in Egypt. Um, later on, petroleum uh, becomes important uh, as we transition to internal combustion engines in the late 18th, early 20th century. Uh, so that becomes a focus. They want to extract cheap raw materials, uh, in some cases exploiting uh, near slave-like or, or, or slave labor to do so. Uh, and so they can use them or manufacture in Europe. Uh, those are sort of their drives. Um, so that'd be one, two, three. And then the fourth one, I wouldn't put this as a driving factor, but it's certainly a, uh, a causal important element, is the uh, existence of new technology that allows them to do these things. So substantial advantages over these uh, established empires in especially Asia and to a lesser extent, but still uh, 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 relevant in Africa, uh, and they also are going to get some medical advances that allow them uh, to uh, penetrate into the interior of Africa for the first time uh, in the late uh, 19, uh, 19th century. Uh, and that's what we talked about during the second Industrial Revolution. So we've got some military, uh, um, military uh, technologies. Uh, we've also got some transportation technologies and some medicines. In fact, I just want to mention them now. What's going to allow them after the 1870s and 1880s specifically, is they can now penetrate into the interior of Africa for, for two primary reasons. Number one, uh, the discovery of uh, quinine or quinine, which um, allows Europeans who had traditionally been devastated by malaria, uh, a tropical disease, uh, and other tropical diseases, that for whatever reason, I don't know if it slows down the, 
um, spread or reproduction of the, of the virus so your immune system can take care of it easier. I'm not sure exactly, but it makes people more resistant to um, uh, some tropical diseases such as malaria. Uh, so that's going to be important. They're also going to be much more uh, aware of, um, of, of, of germs, essentially. They're now aware that, oh, I shouldn't be using the same instruments to uh, perform surgery on everybody because I'm just spreading infections. and. I should boil my water, things like that uh, is really gonna help them out. So they're more sanitary. You also have military um, advances like uh, the uh, breech loading rifles, which fire um, much quicker, much in a, uh, you can reload them quicker. They fire much more accurately because of the rifling in the barrel, uh, which basically, uh, it's kind of like throwing a football just flat or throwing it with a spiral. The spiral stays a lot more true to the course, can go faster and further. Um, and then of course you have less uh, reloading time. Uh, and then uh, we have some proto machine guns too that are devastating in the open field, um, especially in the, the flat terrains of, of most of Africa uh, where um, armies couldn't easily procure cover and the machine guns are just deadly in the open. Um, so that's really gonna help them out. And then transportation wise, they're gonna have, of course, uh, railroads, it takes time to, uh, to establish, but mostly it's gonna be uh, the steamships, specifically uh, larger steel steamships, and that's going to allow them to uh, travel upriver uh, because horses could not go into tropical regions because they would be devastated also by disease. So Europeans hadn't been able to penetrate uh, into the jungles, either due to uh, disease for humans or disease for horses, but now with steamships uh, and medical protection against um, diseases, they're able to do so. And then these military advances are going to allow them also uh, to uh, overwhelm any uh, military resistance from, from opponents. And they largely are going to, with the exception of just a few areas, um, the Western Hemisphere, the uh, United States pretty much keeps Europe out, but most of the Western Hemisphere is or was uh, influenced by Western um, um, governments and powers. Uh, and at, at, at the height, in the early to mid 20th century, Europe uh, or the United States is pretty much going to directly or indirectly control almost all the world with only a few exceptions, um, uh, like Ethiopia, a few smaller regions, um, Siam, which is like now Thailand. Uh, the exceptions are, are relatively few as, as far as uh, who escaped or resisted successfully um, imperialism. So those are kind of the characteristics. So keep those in mind as we go. Uh, but first, like I mentioned, we're gonna talk about uh, Great Britain. So the countries we're gonna focus on are primarily Great Britain, France, to a lesser extent, certainly Germany, um, Russia as well, uh, and Japan. Uh, those are going to be our primary focuses. Uh, and we will get, give some shout outs to the US at uh, a couple times and the Belgians. But for the most part, uh, it's, it's just going to be focusing on uh, Britain, Germany, Russia, Japan, and then to a lesser extent, France. So let's get started with it. So 1881 is kind of when this is um, said to have started, but I would like to point out that the British actually started much earlier than um, the other European states. There's a few reasons for that, uh, and I'll only briefly go over them. Uh, but Britain does get a head start. Britain head start uh, on uh, this new wave of imperialism. And they do so in a few areas. They're going to do it in um, North Africa, South Africa. Uh, in South Asia and India, and Southeast Asia too as well, and then uh, in China, uh, they're gonna, going to uh, get a bit of a head start. The US too, awkwardly enough, is gonna get a little bit of a head start, and the French too, kind of, up here uh, in North Africa, uh, with Japan in the United States, but it, it's largely gonna be Great Britain that jumps out far ahead of everybody else. This is why they're gonna control, I think, almost a quarter of the entirety of the Earth. Uh, at one point because they get a nice head start. There's a couple of reasons for that. I actually don't like this blue pen. Or marker, I'm going to toss that out. Go back to this purple one. Uh, Britain had a couple of advantages. Number one, they were, uh, they had a, how can I phrase this? They had a much stronger economic foundation uh, than the rest. While Germany's definitely going to catch up industrially uh, and, and financially, the British just get too far of a head start. Like Germany's not even a country yet, and Great Britain already has its um, industrial and financial bases established and growing. Um, so they're just going to get a too big of a head start on Germany and the United States, who again are going to catch up um, by the late 19th or early 20th century, but early on it's the British that get this head start. So they have a head start due to their industrial um, uh, origins, 
they are the earliest as far as what we now know as industrialization. Uh, they also have a far more well-developed uh, free market economy and financial system. So they've had established banks for several hundred years, well, at least over a hundred years, um, by the uh, late 1700s, uh, mid to late 1700s, which is where we're going to pick up. They have more property rights. They have more uh, um, legal protections for, 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 like I said, private property and patents and, and things like that. So uh, while those are going to be adopted throughout Europe and in the United States and Japan uh, later, uh, it, Britain just gets a head start. So they're going to have more resources, more technology, and more money uh, to uh, start this, this, this new wave of imperialism uh, and get about a, certainly a 30 or 40 year head start. And then if you're talking about India and their origins there, uh, e even, even sooner than that. So let's, we can actually, I think, start there. I think that's my plan. Yeah, we'll start with the, uh, the British. So just keep that in mind. They have a, a longer industrial history and a, a, a more firmly established um, free market and financial system uh, that are going to be growing. And again, France, no, not France, Germany and the United States do catch up, but Britain gets a big head start. So Britain's first major head start here, uh, we're going to see, was their victory in the Seven Years' War, which we mentioned um, earlier. Um, I'm not going to touch too much on that, just know is it is the first or second technical world conflict where they're fighting on pretty much every continent. Um, but this is where they are going to exercise their naval advantage over the French, French and they're going to seize uh, quite a bit, a few of their territories. Also, they are going to defeat the French and their Indian allies here in uh, eastern India around what is now uh, Bengal. Uh, and that starts in 1757, I'll put India. Um, that's going to start in 1757 when they win the... Um, Battle of Plessy against the forces, um, the uh, Muslim forces, some of which are, are old Mughals, as well as uh, local rulers and with some aid of the French. They're going to win this Battle of Plessy, and they're going to establish, uh, and then shortly after, I think in 1764, they win another one uh, near the end of the Seven Years' War. They're going to first establish, I'll use blue for Great Britain's colonies, so we can kind of have a little idea of. Uh, uh, who's who in this expansion. They're gonna establish a firm base over here in East India. It's small-ish at the start, but they are decisively in control of this. And by uh, 1764, they, uh, the Mughal Empire's influence has been removed here, and it's purely the British. They're the ones that uh, have control of those uh, governments directly. Um, and the way that Britain's gonna go about slowly conquering actually all of the uh, area of South Asia, all of what is now India, um, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, and even into Afghanistan and Persia a bit, is um, they're going to do it through primarily two different uh, ways. And uh, they also kind of finished by, finish by 1764. They firmly established this. There's kind of two ways they slowly expand uh, in East India. They're actually going to be using not even initially just the uh, Royal Navy and, and, and military forces of, uh, of Great Britain, although they are involved, uh, they're going to be primarily doing this through uh, what's going to become known as the uh, British East India Company. Now this is a charter company that is going to function as a state, which we mentioned before. So basically this is just, this company just has the permission of the government to, to act as a government in that area. So they're going to be the ones administering uh, 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 land grants and control of land and taxes in the area. They're going to negotiate with the local rulers or, or, or conquer them uh, with their own private uh, mercenary armies and navy. Uh, they will also get the support of the British uh, Army too at, uh, at various points. Um, and they're again going to function as a government until uh, later the uh, actual British Crown takes over uh, when they uh, deal with a very uh, a large-scale uh, threatening rebellion in 1857, which we'll get to. So there's kind of two tactics that the British East India Company uses. Because again, remember this is primarily a company-based conquest, uh, which is endorsed by the uh, British Crown. Uh, two tactics for conquering India. There is number one. Uh, they of course are just going to conquer and directly control a, a local area. And if you've had world history, or I've mentioned it before in Euro, I can't remember if I have or not. 
India is primarily made up of all these uh, tiny local kingdoms that are ethnically, linguistically, and sometimes religiously different um, than others. So it's not really like this homogenous uh, ethnic, um, ethnic community in India. There's hundreds of different ethnicities in India. So empires in the past, and Britain included, they're going to have to sort of go through all these various smaller kingdoms and sort of bring them under the yoke of their control. And here's how they're going to do it. Number one, of course, is going to be uh, direct conquest and control. And the second way they do this is, depending on the particular uh, uh, polity, they're going to also um, going, uh, control through diplomacy, where basically, diplomacy, where basically they're going to uh, tell a neighboring state, hey, uh, accept our rules and our influence and, and pay us tribute or tax or go by our, our, our standards, or will forcibly remove you by conquest. So uh, many, in many, on many occasions, the uh, local rulers realized the futility in, in, in resisting, and of course, conceded to allow the British East India Company, the British, uh, to largely control their area uh, and, and maintain at least a small amount of their own local power in doing so. So that's pretty much the two ways, uh, conquer them directly or uh, diplomatically add them peacefully, uh, but nonetheless controlled by uh, the British East India Company and later the, uh, the British government. So that's the two ways that they're going to go about this. And well, I can't remember the end of the year for this one. Okay. They do this in a couple of waves. Um, the next major wave is they're going to, uh, in 1799, they're going to, uh, uh, through a series of conflicts, um, defeat the, uh, the Missouri um, Empire here in s southern India. Missouri defeated. 1799. So then they're going to add this region down here that the Mughals uh, had difficulty uh, corralling. Um, the French, by the way, are always going to maintain a couple little ports here, but for the most part, the British uh, are going to dominate. So I'll put a couple little red dots here for France, but that's about it. Um, and the British are going to uh, then, after that uh, series of uh, conflicts and victory, they're going to uh, engage in two or three conflicts. Can't remember if it's two or three. I didn't. I think it's three, and I believe they actually lost the first one. Uh, but by 1818, they had defeated what are uh, what's referred to as the uh, Marathas Confederacy, which was a local group that exploited the declining Mughal Empire and expanded and made a brief uh, sort of confederate empire here in uh, West slash Central India. Confederacy. And again, a confederacy is like a bunch of local kingdoms working together, but not centralized directly. So uh, after a series of conflicts, one in which they lost, they're going to uh, conquer uh, this sort of central uh, and western uh, Indian region. Uh, and at that point, they're going to pretty much control most of what is now India, uh, with a couple exceptions. Uh, and something else is going to extend them actually beyond uh, and up into what is now Pakistan. And that is when they defeat the... Uh, uh, after a series of wars against the uh, Sikh or Sikh empires um, over here in what is now uh, the Punjab area in, in Pakistan, uh, they're going to uh, control pretty much all of what is now India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh uh, as they just slowly add on throughout the years. But those are sort of the major uh, milestones and markers. So uh, the Sikh empires are added here. They even get Kashmir, uh, but then I think they sold that uh, off a bit later. They're going to keep going here, and I'll mention that in a second. So then they're going to conquer the uh, Sikh kingdoms. Or Sikh kingdoms, anyway. Uh, to uh, complete that. That's essentially how they're going to uh, conquer India. Uh, one thing I will mention, though, is shortly after they sort of complete this conquest, and, and, I'll, and in a moment I'll, I'll talk about them extending that on into... Uh, uh, Central Asia and Afghanistan and, and, and the rest of Pakistan. Um, shortly after they consolidate this, there is actually going to be a major uh, rebellion in 1857. This is another example of like resistance to um, imperialism. So that would be, uh, where would I put that? I put that here. We're going to actually have uh, local resistance here. We have what's called the Sepoy Mutiny or the Sepoy Rebellion, which in Sepoy just means Indian infantrymen, uh, uh, or uh, the Indian Rebellion or Revolt. Of 1857. Now it's not throughout the entirety uh, of this area of India. 
but it is going to be quite a scary set of events and moments for um, the British East India Company. Uh, they're going to be, need to be bailed out by the British government, the Royal Crown, and after this the Royal Crown is going to actually take over, which, which I'll mention here in a second. But uh, let me first show you what was going on. The rebellion itself actually, Eastern India was pretty much untouched, same with Southern India, and in fact the Sikh kingdoms, the Sikh kingdoms actually helped out the British. So this wasn't like an entirely organized all of India event, but it does start with a uh, Sepoy mutiny against the British East India Company in central India, um, and they are going to sort of temporarily take uh, Delhi uh, and, and a lar large portion of central uh, Ganges region of India. But uh, within about, I think technically it goes into 1858 of this, but uh, the British East India Company, with the help of the uh, Royal Crown, are going to uh, actually suppress this revolt and maintain control. The only difference is the British government no longer trusts them, so it starts the Sepoy Mutiny. I believe the guy's name was Mangal Pandey that started it. He died immediately, but uh, he started the rebellion. Uh, it was largely focused around central India, and it's going to be a failure, but it was pretty close to unraveling most of what um, the British East India Company had come to control. So there's a, a couple reasons for this actual mutiny and rebellion. Most people actually weren't that concerned with uh, who was actually in charge. And that's true for, for, for most of these populations, by the way. Uh, most of these populations are, are consisting of peasants, whether it's China or Southeast Asia or India. 80 to 90% of them are peasants, and 80 to 90% of them don't really care whether it's a local ruler who's forced them to work or a, 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 a Western foreign uh, power that's doing it. The most people that care are the, uh, the ruling classes there uh, that either feel humiliated or they've had their power taken so they're so they're angry obviously as would anybody be in that position um, but some of the reasons for this were uh, a lot of them disliked the uh, cultural changes uh, the quote-unquote improvements because some of them didn't see it as an improvement like for example the British East India Company established factories and roads and railroads and uh, started mining and, 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 and like I said building factories and that was a net improvement for a lot of people, but a lot of people were opposed to those changes and the cultural changes that came along with it. Uh, they also were not happy about, and the British Crown was not happy about this either. Uh, the British East India Company itself was pretty damn corrupt. So I'll put the company corrupt. Like it didn't even turn a profit uh, because so many of these company officials that were uh, managing the areas uh, as, as governors or, or regional leaders, they were pocketing a lot of the, um, profits from from sales and expansion there so the British government wasn't getting a whole lot if anything um, as far as revenue and then these most of these British East India Company people uh, over in India operating largely out of control of Britain itself were just selfishly pocketing uh, the spoils themselves um, so it's a combination of those things and of course the uh, the, the, the ethnic tension tension was, was of course an issue as well um, so you had the rebellion nonetheless uh, the British Crown is going to take over uh, and from 1857 on, uh, till uh, India became free and split into Pakistan, East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, and India, uh, in 1947, uh, it's going to be refer referred to as British rule or British direct rule, uh, which they sometimes refer to as either British India uh, or the British Raj. Either way, it's the same thing. It's just crown direct rule. So the East India Company lost its charter. In fact, it ceased to exist, uh, and the uh, British government was now directly administering it uh, with their own officials that were answerable directly to the Queen uh, at the time, uh, Queen Victoria. So that is <clears throat> Britain in India and how they got their head start. And as you can see by the years here, they've already established uh, control over all of India and larger areas, which we'll talk about here in a moment, um, before anybody else really large scale gets onto the uh, imperial conquest scene. Uh, so that is uh, Britain. There is one set of resistance that's going to ultimately result in Britain being pressured to leave peacefully, relatively peacefully anyway, uh, and that was, uh, you, I'm sure you all have heard of Mahatma Gandhi, but um, the organization that's going to, uh, in 1885, 1885, begin this process of resisting British rule uh, peacefully, and then later not as peacefully, is the uh, Indian National Congress. Um, and it was mostly, in fact it was all, uh, educated uh, Indian 
nationalists uh, who wanted initially, at a, at a minimum, more Indian involvement in the government affairs. They wanted like a direct dialogue with the uh, uh, the British Raj, like the British government. But the British government didn't wasn't really open to this. Uh, so they wanted a direct dialogue with uh, the British Raj itself. Of course, that's not going to be um, particularly well accepted by most of the British uh, officials, who wouldn't want to, of course, give up their own beneficial uh, power, pay, and prestige uh, by sharing it with, with, with anyone, um, certainly um, local, uh, locals of the population who they may have even seen as inferior, uh, incorrectly, obviously. But nonetheless, um, that's going to continue for a while. And by, I think, about 1908 or so, uh, this, the party itself had split uh, from non-agitators, ones that just wanted this dialogue, to agitators, one that wanted, ones that wanted to actually move for actual separation. But they're going to largely go the non-violent route because they're going to see how violent resistance generally uh, doesn't actually work out very well. Uh, so by 1908, but certainly by 1920, when Gandhi is kind of the unofficial spiritual leader of the, the group, uh, by 1908, they're going to split into agitator groups and non-agitator groups. Um, and they're going to realize that the agitator groups specifically are going to realize their p potential as a, a political party. Um, and they're going to uh, largely organize uh, under the auspices of a, or under the likes of uh, Gandhi and later Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, to uh, lead the uh, nonviolent civil disobedience uh, series of um, a protest that are going to force the British to leave after World War II uh, due to their uh, large scales uh, as far as the protests and whatnot. So that's basically India uh, before we even got to this new imperialism thing. But again, what's characterizing this is the difference here. Uh, you will have some uh, British settlement here, but for the most part, it's going to be um, them just managing them politically and economically with, of course, some uh, British settling over there as well. But this is the first large-scale major um, European colonial empire in Asia. Uh, and again, that's kind of before anybody else even gets out there. Germany doesn't even exist yet by the time they finished uh, colonization of um, uh, India. Actually, here's like finished it. Um, Germany doesn't even exist yet. Uh, in France, while they do have a couple holdings in North Africa, like in Algeria, uh, they're, they're going to be nothing like uh, the, the uh, power of uh, the British. Um, so that's that's India and Great Britain getting a head start. Uh, while I'm still on the subject here of Great Britain, I want to mention Russia too, who by about 1830 is considered by, because again, there's no Germany yet, is considered perhaps along with the French, who of course the British have just dealt, dealt with Napoleon uh, by, by 1815. So that's in the recent memory. But by, by 1830, one of their biggest rivals, at least believed, uh, what was their biggest rivals was Russia, who were, were growing uh, astronomically. So they'd already conquered pretty much all of Eastern Europe. They were chipping away the declining Ottoman Empire uh, in the uh, southern uh, slash eastern provinces of uh, areas of Europe, as well as the uh, Caucasus region. But now they were extending their empire into um, previously un unincorporated uh, Europe, unincorporated territories. So. We have some major empires existing in 1830. Uh, we, we still do have the, um, the, the, the last remnants of what will be, you know, a Persia and Ottoman Empire um, clinging to uh, what they can. Um, and you have the, the Qing Dynasty over here in China, which was, was massive. And in, by 1830, nobody was really quite willing to take China on directly, although it will be pretty quickly here. Um, but there were definitely a lot of uh, mixed smaller states, um, Khanates, Khaganates, and, and and their uh, Islamic um, uh, entities, much smaller, that the Russians were um, able to deal with because of their um, uh, lack of a maritime empire, lack of, um, of industrialization, and at this point, just the sheer, sheer size of Russia. So they were expanding into Central Asia, and they were expanding into East Asia as well because they're about to uh, begin adding territory in what is now Mongolia um, and uh, what is the area just above what is Manchuria that, that's held by China. So Russia's on the rise, and uh, Britain has not had a direct conflict with them yet to realize just how unindustrialized the Russians are. So in 1830, um, the Russians actually are 
probably the biggest threat, along with France, um, uh, to, to British uh, power, uh, certainly around the world. So it's concern. And the British are equally concerned that uh, the Russians are about to, at least in their minds, um, have a common border colonially or, or, or imperially uh, with uh, their colony in India. So they want to they protect that. They want to form a sort of buffer. So they see as a buffer currently uh, the area of Persia, Ottoman Empire, the Qing Dynasty certainly. Uh, the Russians have no capacity to invade uh, navally, but they could get through Central Asia. So the, the British were looking for a barrier here in Central Asia to protect their British colony. They did not want their uh, uh, crown jewel of the uh, royal um, of the British Empire, uh, India, to be uh, under threat or possessed by uh, Russia. So, what this competition to establish this buffer zone uh, in, for fear of uh, of Russia pressuring their, their colony of India. Uh, this is re what is referred to as the uh, great game between Great Britain and Russia. And it stretched from about 1830 to uh, the 1890s, roughly speaking. Uh, at this point, Britain is uh, no longer worried about the threat of Russia, uh, because in the 1880s they actually have a standoff with the Qing Dynasty and they actually back down. And that really uh, showcases to uh, the British that the uh, Russians are not as much of a threat as they, they initially thought. So what this great game was, and I can describe it pretty quickly here, again, they're trying to protect their interest in India. Uh, so what they're going to do, um, much to the surprise of everybody, is they're going to, uh, first of all, extend their uh, colony into what is now Pakistan, uh, and they're going to invade Afghanistan, which is surprising, particularly to the Afghan uh, people. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the sultanate that exists there. Um, I think he's quoted as saying, because they actually, by the way, the um, British underestimate the, the Afghan people, and they have a two, two or three wars with the Afghans, Anglo-Afghan wars, I think there's two. The first one they technically lose. Uh, they get quite far in and they have some blunders uh, and they end up losing to the Afghans um, with a few British soldiers and some uh, Indian soldiers. They actually end up losing that first conflict and the, the, the Afghan ruler at the time was like, I understand, the, uh, the, the power and wealth of, the, of these Europeans and, and their desire to, to conquer India. But he's like, but I don't understand why they're trying to come for my poor desert kingdom or something, something like that. Uh, okay, that was, that was, those were essentially, that was a paraphrase of his own words. Nonetheless, the British do come back uh, for a second um, uh, Afghan war. So we have these uh, um, Anglo-Afghan wars. Uh, but by the mid the mid uh, mid nineteenth century, uh, the second one was 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 a victory for the British. And while they do actually technically pull out, they do uh, leave it as a protectorate, as kind of a buffer zone uh, in Afghanistan. And they get access to poppy seeds, which are going to uh, begin the next series here of um, what's the word I'm looking for of uh, British imperial uh, conquests. So they. Uh, uh, after two wars, they gained control of Afghanistan, or what is now Afghanistan. Uh, they're also going to um, have access to uh, the poppy seeds, which they are going to uh, produce quite a bit of opium with once they bring them uh, uh, to India and start selling them in the Indian Ocean. And they're also going to uh, um, establish the uh, buffer against uh, Russia. And keep that in mind, uh, because the, the British are probably going to incorrectly shift their focus to stopping Russia um, uh, in Central Asia. They also um, fight against Russia during this great game here in the, uh, and this is a direct fight between Russia and Great Britain, well, semi-direct. They're actually going to back up the Ottoman Empire, um, traditionally sort of an enemy of most European states, along with the French. They're going to back up the Ottoman Empire and defeat the Russians, humiliate them actually, um, uh, and defeat them uh, and, and show the lack of industrialization and weakness of Russia at the time. That's called the Crimean Conflict, named after the area in which the conflict took place, this Crimean Peninsula here, uh, and it was a disaster for the Russians. Uh, that was a, a W, 1854, 53 to 54, and that was a uh, major uh, Anglo. French victory with the Ottoman Empire too, but uh, over the Russians.
And like I mentioned before, this sort of great game kind of comes to an end in the 1880s and 1890s when Russia is faced with a conflict about border disputes with the Qing, and uh, the Russians actually back off um, instead of pressing what was probably their advantage. And at that point, the, uh, the British had well realized that the main threat was not Russia. They were much less capable than they previously thought, and then they had realized uh, the main threat was not France, was not Russia, was not the United States, it was Germany uh, who were rapidly catching up and extremely nationalistic and uh, bent on um, expanding their empire as well. Uh, so that's what the great game was, if you ever hear that, it's this kind of temporary concern with the uh, size and power of Russia, but uh, establishing the buffer in Central Asia, defeating Russia in the Crimean War, uh, and also seeing them uh, back down to the Qing and then lose later to the Japanese uh, was, uh, was, was cause for not having concern for the Russians. All right, cool. <clears throat> Let me get my voice a break, and when I uh, get back, we'll talk about uh, still the British, still ahead of the game, uh, in North Africa, uh, South Africa, and China. And then we can finally move on to this actual new imperialism where uh, France, Germany, uh, Russia, and Japan are going to join the game. Continuing, the uh, British have established a presence in um, Asia, in Central Asia and South Asia. They're going to extend that too, by the way, over the years into parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, all right. And um, now we'll talk about their um, uh, incursions into China. So one thing that we should note here by their connections with India uh, was also their connection, of course, to the Indian Ocean Trade Network and their selling of opium, which is an addictive uh, pain-killing drug. Um, obviously, the opiate branch uh, is derived from the poppy seed and, and uh, refined, obviously, to be a heroin-like, highly addictive drug. Um, it's going to, of course, initially begin sales uh, in the Indian Ocean and become highly profitable. Uh, and they're also going to sell to Chinese smugglers who are going to steal it into Imperial China, where the drug itself is made illegal uh, when there's a large spike in usage, uh, most of it coming from um, British merchants slash uh, Chinese smugglers. Um, the British, of course, can use this as a tactic to sort of even the trade deficit because uh, there used to be a large amount of silver poured into um, China to get silk and, and, and uh, tea and porcelain and other uh, Chinese-made goods. But uh, with the sale of opium, uh, the British were hoping to even that trade balance because they were dumping a lot more money into the Chinese um, economy than the, they were extracting. So they tried to, and this is a little mercantile, but nonetheless, they were trying to balance this, this trade deficit um, because there's no knowledge economy there. Back then, they're still just primarily manufacturing. Uh, they tried to, to balance it with opium trade, but it actually ends up tipping it in the favor of the British. Uh, so far more silver is coming out of China and going to Britain. Uh, from these uh, opium sales. So, um, I can't remember if it was the 1820s or 1830s, nonetheless, uh, the Chinese response was to ban the substance itself, but the British are going to persist in um, selling it uh, in China uh, to Chinese smugglers and uh, to and off the coasts of China as well. So, um, they're actually going to fight a war over this conflict. So, uh, the beginnings of incursion in China, so Britain, China, and this is the first real example we have of imperialism in China. We have had the Portuguese uh, sort of negotiate with um, the Chinese before and engage with them, but no one's really attempted to really impose their will on China quite like the British are going to at this point. Um, so we'll talk about what they're doing in Africa shortly after this, uh, but we'll talk about China first because it does appear uh, first chronologically. Oh, I should have put the other ones on the... Uh, um, Timeline here. Oh, he's blue for the British. So we have the Battle of Plessy. Of course, the British in India. Uh, then we have the uh, Masuri, went over the Masuri. And then we have in 1818 the win over the Marathas Confederacy. And then in 1849, the victory of the Sea Kingdom, Kingdoms. That's when the British East India Company is uh, under control of uh, the British East India Company. Or sorry, India is under control of the British East India Company. And by 1857, we have that um, um, Indian Rebellion and now the beginnings of the uh, British Raj. British Raj. So that's where we left off. Oh, and then the Indian National Congress, too. We'll put that up here in 1885. 
Indian National Congress. Uh, that's going to go on. Uh, I do obviously extend the size of the decades here uh, because there's a lot more activity that we're going to talk about, especially in this time period as opposed to that time period. Uh, but there is uh, Britain being tracked here in blue, um, moving onward. So um, China. China is, actually I'll probably keep it to regions. So the blue will be India, actually. Um, and then China I'll put up here in red. Well, I'll, I'll decide it as I go. But that, that's going to be India. So Britain and China. China is uh, going to, the, the currency here is going to start, like I said, with the opium uh, trade. So we have actually two wars referred to as the opium wars. We'll talk about them. Uh, the first one is from 1839 to 1842. Uh, that's the first opium war. And this is pretty much just um, Great Britain uh, versus Imperial China under the Qing Dynasty. I should put Qing China so it makes more sense. Uh, to 1842. Um, this one doesn't initially start off directly as a conflict. So there's the sale of opium, um, and, and pretty much the Qing court decides to try to administer this. They, they have it banned, obviously, uh, and then they try to have uh, Chinese officials enforce that, and, and most of it's coming in, in here in southern China uh, through Macau and other ports. So um, they actually initially try to take a fairly peaceful um, approach. Uh, they send a letter to... Uh, the queen, and uh, they don't get a reply. I don't I remember if it was, like, it wasn't sent or wasn't delivered, nonetheless there was no reply. Uh, so they initially tried to just say, hey, uh, can you not endorse this? It's illegal in your country, it's illegal here. Can you please uh, do your best to keep your own merchants from selling us illegal substance here? No reply. Uh, and then, instead of going down and just, you know, uh, by force confiscating the opium and, and, uh, from the uh, British merchants um, or, or, or ships, they actually offer to uh, um, uh, compensate them uh, by trading the opium into the government to be destroyed, hypothetically, um, destroyed and then uh, for tea, like almost like so there's no collateral. Um, but they, uh, they, they declined, the uh, British merchants uh, and, and sailors and, and Chinese smugglers down here in southern China. So then they actually resort to active force uh, and, and take it from the ships and uh, warehouses. Uh, and it was like thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of opium. Are confiscated uh, and Great Britain is going to object to that and the objections actually uh, lead to a declaration of war between the two states and so we have our first direct conflict on a large scale between China and a European power uh, with the first opium war um, so the result of that is a uh, British victory uh, they won due to their uh, naval and military technology uh, naval superiority and military, uh, technological military superiority, military superiority. Uh, the Chinese did, I believe, have some uh, some cannon ability to, to manifest cannons, but the British guns were just uh, far more efficient, and they think they were like 1.5 or two times the range, so they could literally just park their boats off the side of, of any city or port they wanted to and bombard it into submission, and there was nothing the Chinese uh, could do about it. Uh, and then when their Marines were on the ground, they had naval support and um, more advanced weaponry and, and, and eventually breech loading rifles and more advanced military tactics with that weaponry because they've been rehearsing that in Europe for decades at this point, especially at the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so uh, China was uh, unfortunately uh, on the losing end of this conflict. Uh, and that's going to be a big deal because that's going to drastically change the image and reputation of China to the rest of the world, um, and it's going to change uh, the relationship they have with Great Britain, who achieves or obtains a favored nation status. Like, they basically get special privileges in China that no other countries get or more attention than, than other countries get. So it's going to change the attitude slightly of Japan here, who for hundreds of years has been sort of a, a submissive state or uh, a tribute state um, to China. Uh, and pretty soon that revolt role is actually going to reverse to where Japan's actually the bully of China, who has for centuries been the uh, overlord of the region, uh, with the exception of those uh, pastoral uh, invasions by the Mongols and, and Zhongnu from before. Um, but that's AP world history. Uh, so that superiority is going to uh, be the result, but the, this is the beginning of a series of treaties referred to as the unequal treaties by the Chinese. Um, and, and among other things, Britain's going to actually obtain uh, Hong Kong, which they just gave up in 1997, by the way, so that's a pretty recent one. Uh, so Hong Kong off the uh, coast of China, um, and uh, they're going to have a, a British 
government administered uh, port and territory, uh, plus a few others. I think there were four others. Don't quote me on that. It doesn't really matter. What does matter, though, is uh, they get Hong Kong, and the uh, British actually get to uh, um, uh, access uh, to uh, coastal settlement and trade. And the Christian missionaries are allowed for the first time into China. Uh, so we have a, a much larger than before Chinese, or sorry, European presence in China, most of course um, uh, through the British. Uh, over the next few years, uh, they're also going to establish trade relations with France uh, and the United States, uh, and uh, down the road, uh, more so by force, Germany. But um, between 1842 and 1856, which is the second Opium War, um, they're going to establish, like I mentioned, uh, favorable treaties with the United States and uh, France. So Britain is going to request a renewal of their treaty uh, to be superior to that of the French and the United States. They increased their amount of demands too, by the way, as far as British uh, merchant privileges and uh, uh, establishing of, of, of other factories and um, settling of British settlers and companies uh, throughout uh, more of China, to which China, of course, is going to disagree. And there is some uh, resentment building in China against these foreigners uh, because they are becoming increasingly present um, uh, through the British. Um, I believe the British uh, had a port or access to what is now around the area of Shanghai, uh, which is more so a central to northern central China. Uh, so you have the uh, presence and influence of a lot more uh, foreigners, whether they're American, British, French, or, or, or whatnot. Uh, missionaries, and there is some local resentment towards that, particularly among officials. Uh, li I'd like to mention again, though, that generally speaking, in any given state, the, the peasants, which are 80 to 90 percent of the population, they don't really care who's in charge. There's no, there's not a particularly uh, pronounced set of uh, resentful beliefs uh, or humiliation, uh, but certainly among the uh, cultural elites uh, or, or political elites, there definitely is. Um, so, the reason why I mention this is the Second Opium War, which China's going to lose again, uh, involves the British, first of all, of these disputes about re renegotiating a, a more uh, favorable treaty for the British, but the French are actually going to get involved as well. Uh, they won't do quite as well as the British, but um, the British and French naval forces are just way, they far outmatch the, the Chinese. And to make the Chinese situation a bit worse, they're currently dealing with or having just dealt with, I can't remember exactly what year it ended. I think it was over by the time the second Opium War started, but they had just recently had a major rebellion down here called the Taiping Rebellion uh, that killed like 30 million Chinese, which was a, a, an astronomical amount back then, um, especially considering they weren't using modern, a whole lot of modern technology. Like there were no machine guns or artillery or planes or things like that. So these are good old fashioned terrible, you know, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat deaths, disease deaths, starvation deaths. Um, and China got torn up. A lot of Chinese ended up bailing and going to the Americas uh, for better job opportunities in the United States and Latin America. Sometimes as indentured servants that were basically slaves, uh, but sometimes as uh, genuine contracted laborers and indentured servants that uh, benefited from it, uh, from getting out of China at the time, finding opportunity in the Americas and or sending money back uh, to their families in China. Regardless, uh, the Second Opium War is going to start, again, over disputes, primarily dealing with this, the renewal of the trade, or sorry, the renewal of the treaty, uh, and the French also get involved because there was uh, some sort of uh, local um, southern Chinese uh, um, incident where like some French mercenaries were killed. So the French were looking to exact revenge for that and of course trying to um, uh, uh, take advantage of a, an exploitable situation, which they did. Um, so, it's going to be a British and French victory. Uh, the United States tactically helped the British and French out, but they weren't really, um, uh, what you'd call, a, a significant part of the fighting. It's pretty much the British, and then to a lesser degree, but still there, the French. They're going to uh, net a victory. So they're going to gain access to a lot more ports, gain access to more territory. But the big change here, so the French are going to open up uh, and control several more ports here in southern China, which is where they're going to exercise most of their influence after 1881. Uh, but also you're going to have uh, more British ports and access as well and territories. But uh, the, the change here is not only going to enhance missionary activity in, in, in China, Christian missionary activity, which is going to breed more 
local resentment by officials, they're actually gonna open up the interior. So the British get access to the full um, uh, Yangtze River Valley, which is a huge chunk of their population. Uh, the other major river valley is the Yellow River Valley, which is more northern. The Germany's gonna get uh, influence of that later. But the British are gonna basically uh, kind of not have control directly, like British administers, but you have um, what's called extraterritoriality, where British and French can't be tried for Chinese laws by Chinese officials. If they commit a crime, uh, they have uh, immunity, essentially. They have to be tried by their own uh, officials and laws. So they're kind of able to operate in China largely ignoring any customs or laws by uh, Chinese officials. So for the British and French, at least at that time, that's gonna mean they're gonna establish what we call spheres of influence in China, which is kind of a generic term for like when another country is there practicing some form of, 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 of like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Castrated, um, that's not a good word to use, of reduced imperialism, where again, it's not direct control, but you basically have in China, British, French, and other European uh, merchants and citizens settling, building, establishing factories, ports, shipping, ignoring local laws and customs and doing going about their business as they please because they technically have uh, diplomatic immunity. Um, just like the, the song from uh, Family Guy, if anybody watched the early Family Guy videos uh, or shows, that was uh, what the French and British and later Germans, Russians, Japanese, and Americans are going to enjoy there as well. Actually, not the Americans take that out. Um, so we have extraterritoriality, extraterritoriality. Uh, again, so that's basically immunity from Chinese laws and customs and officials. Um, so it's almost like you can do whatever you want in China uh, without any repercussions from local administration. Um, you also have increased missionary presence and uh, opened up the interior of China. Interior of China. And again, this is sort of the beginning of, wow, my wording is really bad down here. Interior of China. All right, uh, so these two wars, again, known as the Opium Wars, uh, are the beginning of what we call the spheres of influence in China by Western powers and Japan. And again, a sphere of influence is basically where um, spheres of influence this is where uh, a foreign country is practicing some sort of lighter version of imperialism. Again, operating there largely uh, immune to or, 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 or ignoring local laws and customs and settling, operating their businesses, building factories, shipping, etc., as if it's their own country and, and, and these other people don't exist or can't, can't affect them. So uh, some sort of economic or political uh, hegemony uh, by a foreign power. Because what's eventually going to happen when we get this new wave of imperialism is you're going to have the British here in China, uh, in, in central China, the French here in southern China. Um, in kind of central northern China, you're going to have the Germans, uh, Russians, and Japanese too. And China is, is going to be under threat of suffering the same fate of, as India uh, regarding to being dismembered territorially, uh, and just partitioned amongst European powers and, and controlled as a colony. This can become a major threat. So, uh, in response to this threat, we're going to have the Chinese uh, engage in what's called the self-strengthening movement. This is an AP World topic, but I'll, I'll just briefly explain it. So this is where they say, you know what, this is just a, a hiccup in Chinese history. These Westerners have just luckily gotten ahead of us because, I don't know, we... we, we uh, we're ignorant or, or made a mistake or we're, we're just basically uh, experiencing a temporary setback. That was the attitude of many uh, Eurasian powers, by the way, uh, as these Europeans continue to expand. Um, so they, they attempt to change things, but they, they agreed that their culture of, of collectivism and Confucian ideology uh, rejected um, individualism and, and, and Western economic practices and political practices. And they said, we're just gonna focus specifically on modeling their maritime uh, uh, policies regarding trade and emphasis, and then we're also going to try to adopt a, a modern banking system, uh, and the, uh, the uh, British uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Company is going to actually be established, but that's not the Chinese is doing. Um, getting off topic, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, they're going to try to adopt uh, modern industrial military technology, so uh, no political or cultural uh, reforms, 
but they're going to try to adopt Western military technology and uh, some economic practices. All right, uh, and while Europe's going to be distracted in what's later called the scramble for Africa, China's going to try to bolster itself, uh, and they're actually going to sort of bluff Russia into backing down on claims of territory uh, and control here in the um, northern China slash Mongolia region. Uh, so that's going to be appear to be successful in the 1880s. Uh, successfully intimidate Europeans, particularly Russia, uh, until they're exposed uh, in 1895 when they fight the previously inferior, much smaller Japan and lose horribly. We'll, we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, but that's kind of what, what we're going to see here in China. So let me actually catch this up. We've got here. In, uh, 39 to 42, which would be here-ish. We got the uh, first opium war. Then we have the second opium war here in, ending in the late 1850s. Then we have this sort of self-strengthening movement that's gonna sort of end up becoming a failure uh, for uh, strength for China. Um, but we are going to have the beginnings of what we know as the spheres of influence. Which again means they're not quite controlled by uh, other countries, but foreign influence is strong to the point that British and French, at this point later Germans and Russians are going to, and Japanese are going to have diplomatic immunity uh, in the areas that they're at, and then they can go th into the interior of China, spreading their uh, Christian uh, missionary work or, or whatever, uh, largely uh, ignoring any sort of Chinese customs uh, or Officials. So that's going to be pronounced here in the 1890s, uh, the spheres of influence in China. And that's going to be probably China's most embarrassing moments in history. Um, I'm not sure if they put it on par with the uh, defeat by the uh, Mongol Empire or Xiongnu of the, of the uh, steppe regions, but um, Certainly it's up there. Top one to uh, three position would be top one. In the, in the one to three position as far as the most humiliating eras in Chinese history would probably be this 19th century, particularly the late 19th, early 20th century when they're bullied by the Japanese, uh, the Russians, and, and other Europeans, even the United States uh, to a lesser degree. All right, so that's, that's Britain and China. <clears throat> Before this whole thing begins, and we, we come back to it briefly, uh, after this new imperialism wave. All right, so we're almost done with Britain, and we'll briefly talk about uh, Japan, too. Then we can finally focus on the uh, specifics of, of, uh, of Africa and um, this new wave, including Germany. Still no Germany yet. We're still talking about uh, the British early on. So we'll focus now on North Africa and South Africa. So uh, Britain in Africa, pre-1881. Uh, so again, Britain's still out of the game for the reasons we mentioned. Uh, economically, militaristically, and even politically, they were just ahead of the curve uh, for Europeans, but Germany, the United States, and to a lesser degree, France, uh, and then Japan would, would catch up as well. So we can see the beginnings of this uh, as early as the 1860s. I think it's in 1869 they complete construction of it. Uh, we have the British building the uh, Suez Canal. Uh, they don't conquer Egypt yet. Egypt at this point is technically still a part of the Ottoman Empire. They're independent. They're a Kedivate, which means that they have their own independence. But they're technically still a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire, but realistically the Turks don't have a lot of control of the area. It's pretty much just the uh, the, uh, the people of Egypt, whether they're, they're whatever type of Mamluk they might be. All right, so you have Egypt here, and at this point, uh, it's a contract. It's a lease for I think it was 99 years and I began like 1856 or 1859 uh, It took about 10 years to finish uh, But they're gonna in fact I think I think the, initially it was the French that were planning on doing this and then the British ended up taking over it because they had the uh, uh, Technological and um, uh, Financial means to do it. Uh, it It's initially a lease from the Kedavate of Egypt, so they don't own the land, but uh, in 1882 
they are going to um, actually invade and, and, and directly control it. I think it's actually even still technically an Ottoman territory, but the British consider a protectorate and, and administer the uh, uh, law there. So in 1882, uh, you actually have the British formally invade Egypt uh, and control the canal. But do note that they put this canal here. Um, this was 1869. It was actually initially an idea of the uh, Venetian uh, merchants, but nobody in, in the 1200s or 1100s had the, the um, means to do that. The Ottoman Empire flirted with the idea. I can't remember why they didn't go through with it, um, but the British are going to be the ones that, uh, after the French, are going to actually take it and, and complete the project after about 10 years. Um, thousands and thousands of workers worked on this thing. Uh, a bunch die because it's basically slave labor. Uh, for, uh, of local uh, Mamluks and Egyptians and, and uh, prisoners of war that are used to do this. They die of disease and overwork and all that stuff. But um, it does drastically reduce the amount of time and money it costs uh, and time it takes uh, to uh, connect the Indian Ocean uh, to Europe. So now instead of having to sail all the way around Africa, you can pay um, uh, to uh, just go directly through the Red Sea uh, into the Mediterranean Sea and then enter into the um, Mediterranean network in, in southern Europe here, or uh, come out around to the northern Atlantic to Britain. Either way, it's much quicker. And in fact, the British are going to consolidate that by controlling this point here at Gibraltar, which is like the choke point of the Mediterranean. So the British uh, do a great, great job of tactically uh, controlling key choke points and trade points uh, throughout the um, uh, Afro-Eurasia uh, regions. The United States is going to follow suit to the same thing in Panama in 1898, um, but uh, that's that's a, 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 an AP US topic. So I realize that's actually in this time period, but I just want to preview that they were actually involved in Egypt prior to that, and then to uh, control and consolidate uh, that Suez Canal largely, they're going to actually forcibly take that from the quickly declining Ottoman Empire, who in the 1800s pretty much loses all of the rest of their empire. That was the stretch of North Africa, uh, two parts of Levant and Turkey and the Caucasus region and, and the Balkans and parts of Eastern Europe. All of that's gonna fall apart for the most part. And by um, by World War One, all they have is this strip of the Levant, Turkey, and that's pretty much it. Um, they'll be chiseled down. So you see them uh, in, in Africa over there. And in South Africa, they actually take this area from the Dutch and what are called the Boer Wars earlier in the uh, 19th century. So yay them, Boer Wars. Uh, take South Africa from the Dutch. The reason why we care about this is that we have one of the uh, biggest, I guess you'd say embarrassments or blunders of the uh, British. And that's gonna be their uh, uh, laud loss of the Battle of Islawalanda to Native Africans. That was the first one First battle Native Africans won against the uh, British because uh, the British were drastically underestimated um, the uh, Zulu Kingdom. So the Zulu Kingdom uh, began in, oh, I forget the exact year. I want to say it was 1832. It wasn't exactly it. Shaka Zulu is the guy who established it. And he was later killed because he wasn't around by the time the uh, English engaged. But by 1879, the British were expanding their, their territorial control of South Africa. And they uh, ran into some resistance here. And they thought that uh, these um, uh, Africans, that, Native Africans that were resisting them were like the rest. They were just kind of like local tribes and, you know, a few hundred soldiers could take care of it because they weren't organized, they didn't have weaponry. But they didn't know that this was actually a, a large African empire that had recently shaped, uh, taken form. And the, uh, the, the manpower behind this Zulu uh, uh, kingdom that had been expanding for several decades, I believe that... Their army consisted of more than 20,000 African warriors. So when the British showed up with like 1,200, maybe it was less than 1,000, around 1,000 soldiers to fight what they thought were just a few local tribes. Uh, it turns out that they got, you know, outnumbered about 20 to 1 uh, and surrounded and massacred at this Battle of Iswalanda. Uh, so that was embarrassing for them. Uh, but once they realized that the Zulu Kingdom was actually an empire and had a large army, they sent a much larger force. Uh, and after the Anglo-Zulu Wars, or war, they're going to uh, incorporate the Zulu Kingdom as well. Uh, and again, that's good. so they absorb this uh, Zulu nation as well and expand their control of um, South Africa. All right, and the Portuguese, of course, are gonna hold both points of uh, uh, what is Angola, 
another region in South slash East Africa. They've had those for quite a while. That's largely going to remain the same. So that's Britain uh, with their early excursions into Africa. We'll talk more about Africa though when we talk about this actual new imperialism. So I did want to mention that Boer Wars, and they're actually going to uh, uh, control South Africa after the uh, Anglo Zulu War in 1879. So that is technically, except for this British invasion, that's all technically pre new wave of imperialism, uh, certainly pre scramble for Africa. Uh, the um, uh, British got a, got a head start. The French technically did too, by the way. I don't want to leave them out of this. They're actually going to strip away um, Algeria and Tunisia from the Ottoman Empire um, a bit early, I think in 1830 and 18... I think I wrote down because I always forget the damn date. 1830? Was that what it was? Yeah, 1830. They took Algeria. Tunisia a little later. But uh, France is also going to... Uh, join the party a tiny bit early. France takes Algeria plus Tunisia from uh, declining Ottoman Empire. Uh, I don't remember the exact year Tunisia was taken, but Algeria was 1830, so I'll put 1830 right there. All right, so that is uh, Britain, early on in Africa. Africa, I'm gonna put in purple, so We'll put uh, the years here. So by 1882, I'm going to leave this actually. This is basically just a scramble for Africa. I'll just do the earlier ones, which would be 79, Anglo Zulu War. Where they take South Africa and they are into Egypt. So put the Suez Canal here ish. British Suez Canal. And then we have French. Algeria here. All right, so that is, uh, with the one exception I mentioned here, that's pretty much uh, the large-scale British um, control expansion of colonial um, uh, territory and power in uh, Africa and Asia. And again, they're quite a bit ahead of the rest of the Europeans on doing that. There were still some instances going on here in West Africa and Central Africa, but nothing like what's going to take place in the 70s and certainly by the 1880s with this new wave of imperialism. So that's Britain. So what I want to focus on before we actually fully touch on uh, new imperialism is going to be uh, the emergence of Japan uh, as an industrial power and then uh, Russia and their attempts to also industrialize, which they're ultimately going to fail at uh, and be humiliated in their defeat by Japan. So we'll do that here in a second. Uh, 